And we are recording. How are you doing today, Casey? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing great. It's uh, an extremely beautiful day outside here in Michigan. Yes, it is. <laughs> Compared to the last week we've had, absolutely. Uh, the last week has been, I mean, yeah, the last week and the last few days particularly have been kind of kind of rough. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, now, are you from the Lansing area? I live in Owasso, which is about oh. 45 minutes Okay. Here. Okay. Yeah, that's quite a drive. Um, so I, thank you for making the drive and coming here. Absolutely. This is an important topic. Yeah, absolutely. Um, how did you hear about the podcast? Um, I actually saw it on Facebook and, um, uh, on a, uh, 517 Facebook page that kind of, um, announces new businesses and recommendations. And I thought this would be an excellent tool to get my message out. This is my very first one. So I appreciate you posting, um, <laughs> posting it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's what, that's what I'm here for is to help other people, um, talk about the subjects they're passionate about. And that's kind of what I'm passionate about is helping other people. So find their voice. It's great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now you said you're from Owasso. Were you born and raised there? Well, um, I was born at Sparrow. Okay. Um, I, um, have kind of a cool history. I was, uh, born at 20 weeks gestation. Mm. Uh, that's, very premature. Yeah. Um, I weighed 15 ounces. I've personally had wow. my 15 minutes of whatever you fame. Um, <laughs> I've been in newspapers. Um, okay. I'm in a book. Yes. I mean, wow. like my whole, what book? Uh, it is actually a book written about um, miracles. Um, mm. And I'm on the very first page. The uh, doctor and nurses looked at my parents and said, take a look at her now. She will not make it to the end of the hallway. I was given a one in a million chance from day one. That's kind of messed up to say. That's and and and. <laughs> They didn't give me much of a fighting chance at all. Yeah, and so I'm wow. here. I, I've, uh, I have, I have a legacy to, um, you know, what I mean, provide. Most people can't yeah. believe my birthing story. It, it mouths drop. Wow. I was born in 1979. I, I was wrapped in, in bubble wrap to keep me warm. Wow. They had to hand make clothing. So yeah, we, I was born, my, my dad, um, worked for Walmart and moved around a little bit as a child. And then we moved back up here in 1989 and okay. we uh, settled in Owasso. Awesome. Awesome. Owasso is a nice town. Yes. Yep. Yeah. It's kind of small. It is yeah. compared to, to compared to Lansing. Yes. Yeah. But, um, it's, it's a nice little, it's a nice little town. Yeah. It, and it kind of has everything too. It does. It's like the bigger town of the area. <laughs> That's correct. Like we are the biggest town in the County. That's okay. correct. We have, you know. Everything you need, that's where everybody goes, is to my town in the county. Yeah, I have some friends that live out there. Uh, they don't live in Owasso. They live in, uh, like, Morris. That's Oh, that's country. Yeah, yeah, that's country. <laughs> <laughs> that's country. Um, so let's kind of get into your story. And uh, I know you wanted to talk about um, uh, chronic pain and the people that have to deal with that, and as well as yourself. So let's kind of start off with your story and your personal journey and then what led, it, led you into helping other people. Okay, well, my personal journey, I have um, several autoimmune diseases. They are invisible. Um, it, I have been, um, since for the last 15 years, I've been fighting them. Um, usually, if people can't see the disease, they don't believe the severity, um, or they don't believe that I've tried every treatment method that you can research or anybody else. Um, I have something called small fiber neuropathy, um, it is people that suffer from nerve damage or neuropathy know that nerve pain is on a level by itself. Like there's nothing that you can even, I would rather go through labor and delivery 24 seven with no epidural. Mm. Then, then wow. it's like, like as I sit here, it, it feels, my feet feel like I'm standing in like a piping hot pan of bacon grease. Uh, if you're from Michigan, like when your feet, when you were a kid, you go outside and go sledding, your feet would get frostbitten. Mine never unfreeze like when you're running to the the you're at the beach and you're running uh, on the hot asphalt to get to the water or running through the hot sand the bottom of my feet never cool off wow so it's like a sizzling searing i mean it's 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 consuming and it's always um, on your feet it's i have it from both knees to the tips of my toes wow so but if unless i told you yeah. you would never know that i'm feeling this pain most people that have invisible illnesses like this we were a mask. So like only our immediate family and very close friends will see, you know, the real Casey. So if, why is that? Is it, is it because there's like some shame that's wrapped correct. around it? People that's think correct. you're just crazy. They people, if people cannot visually see 
what's going on. They don't believe that you've tried every option, that if you were in that much pain, you'd be rolling on the floor. Well, you just can't do that 24 hours a day. You cannot sleep. You cannot scream. You cannot roll on the floor. That's going to get you a one-way ticket to the psych ward, and they're going to think you're crazy. Yeah. And you're like, no, I'm just in – there are – there's – the people that live in something called intractable pain, um, that our pain would incapacitate 99% of people. Like, you wouldn't be able to do what we do. We've had to learn to live with that type of caustic, torturous, barbaric pain. I have a lot of, I, I would have never thought myself where I'm at right now. The reason why I started to help people advocate is because I had a really bad experience and I, and it's, it's, it's all about the experience. Mm. I don't want anyone else to end up where I was. I, I, I had started a TikTok following a TikTok page because I thought to myself, how can I reach the most amount of people? And I would have never thought that I have, you know, I, I've created a community for others that are sick, just like me. TikTok is definitely the way to go. <laughs> I mean, I, I just, there are, I have, I am fully inclusive. Um, I, I am LGBTQ plus friendly. There's no, um, everybody's welcome and safe there. People can let their invisible illnesses masks fall down and we can just be people. I cannot have the conversations that I have with my fellow Spoonies, which for anyone who doesn't know what a Spoonie is, it's I'm talking about the spoon theory. The spoon theory is a uh, measurement of time for people with chronic and visible illnesses. Usually you have 12 spoons per day. So if you work, you take five spoons right off the top. So you only have seven spoons and each activity you do costs you a spoon. Um, so for the people that are chronically ill that are still out in the working world, I see you. You are so very strong. People don't take into consideration this episode is brought to you by Red Bike Delivery. This delivery service operates only using battery-powered, eco-friendly transportation. Red Bike Delivery is there for all your delivery needs, whether it's dinner for the family, flowers for your partner, or new houseplants for your new collection. Red Bike Delivery will gladly deliver those and everything in between. So what are you waiting for? Check out Red Bike Delivery on Facebook or Instagram for more information. Red Bike Delivery, because there's only one Earth. Your commute, you have to work all day, you've got to people all day, and then your commute home. A lot of my spoonies that have that are still working are recovering every weekend because they've used everything they have just to work during the week. Does that make sense? It makes absolute sense. I mean, I work at GM, so I'm constantly working up and down the line. And when I come home, and my wife too, she works there too. Um, our feet hurt, yes. you know, and not on a level that yours hurts, but what I'm describing is, you know, just a normal person, somebody who doesn't have any extra health problems right. or conditions like, like yourself or people like you. Um, but when we come home, you know, our feet are throbbing, they're swollen, our hands throb cause we're using them all day and we have to find other ways to other modalities to help, you know, help with that, like massaging them. And like, we have like this foot massager and I have a, a like a Theragun type thing where I can beat up my muscles and yes. try to recover for the next day. But I couldn't imagine having to go through a whole day being in pain all day and then having to come home and and still be in pain and not really have a cure or a way to to manage it. Is there now is there ways to manage it? Can you take like ibuprofen? I feel like that's a dumb question, but can you take like pain medication like that to help? You can in the beginning you can and that's what a lot of people don't understand. Can, can you pull the mic slightly closer? <laughs> Is that better? There you go. Oh, yeah, sorry. That sounds great. So, a lot of people like okay. I have something called my treatment toolbox and I have many different treatment methods in my toolbox that have to work in concert or together all at the same time for me to be able to get um decrease in the sharpness of my pain. That's what a lot of people, let me back up. That's what a lot of people don't understand is people that live in our type of pain, intractable pain, there's never a time when we're not in pain. That The only time that we're not in pain is when we sleep. Mm. And you can't sleep for 24 hours a day because then you miss your life. Yeah. Uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. So 
it can start out with ibuprofen or Tylenol, but a lot of times there's, there's, um, you know, compounding, um, issues that, you know, there needs to be something stronger. I really want to talk about, uh, people that take, um, opiate pain medication. Um, a lot of people think that that is, <laughs> close enough. you're good. You're that good. is our first line of treatment. No. When you're on pain medication like that, folks, there's no other treatment method known to man. Um, I have a $120,000 spinal cord stimulator. I was so desperate for pain relief that I put a device in my body that ended up being botched. Um, Wow. Opiate pain medication. What do you mean by by that? What do I mean by botched? So um, nowadays, when you go to a pain clinic... um, It's not like it used to be when it was individualized care, folks. What it is now is it's, and I know people are going to, it's it's gone from the pill mill to the drill mill. These doctors are forcing their patients to get unnecessary procedures and devices. The only person that usually benefits from those said experiences is the doctor in their checkbook, their wallet. Mm. And they know that. Yeah. Like one of the number one money-making things at a, at a pain clinic, folks, are injections. And I don't hear very many people getting benefits and the adverse reactions are are bad. They're non-FDA approved. And most people are going to be like, well, what do you mean? My doctor didn't tell me. Of course they're not going to tell you because if they tell you it's non-FDA approved – you're not going to do it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So how can they force you to do that? So what they say is if you don't get this injection, we're not going to give you your pain medication. Wow. That's the plight of the pain patient. And for most of... Is that even legal? It's a fine line. It's a fine line. These wow. the, and, and it's it's like in for most patients, they're being undertreated. So like, like the CDC put out guidelines in 2016 um, that have absolutely harmed millions of people. I understand, I understand that there, I'm, I'm switching to a different topic. No, I understand you're good. You're that good. there is any there. Does anybody ever wonder why the overdoses are skyrocketing, but the amount of doctors that are willing to prescribe life-sustaining medication and for anyone that doesn't think that opiate pain medication is life-sustaining then you don't have the type of pain that intractable pain patients live with it's that stark it's either i have my medication and my other treatment methods to bring the sharpness down so i can feel like i'm a person and be a mom and a wife and uh, when i have quality of life my entire family has quality of life it just trickles down. Do you know what I mean? Mom's yeah. able to check in today. Do you know what I mean? Right. It's it's heavy to carry this stuff around. And like I said, if you looked at me, you would never know I'm sick like this. Yeah. There's millions and millions of people that are being forced tapered off of their pain medication. Any doctor worth their salt, folks, would never take you off a medication that you're stable on. It's frustrating. Um, people are desperate. Like, just desperate for, we're talking, this is like, basic stuff like folks are assuming that when you're going to go into the hospital that you're going to be treated with pain medication don't assume that they're sending people home with open heart surgery with tylenol folks if you think i'm exaggerating that's yeah, true it's the and my it, wife had surgery i think uh and she was prescribed tylenol yeah they're sending <laughs> people home with hip replacements knee replacements um shoulder replacements you're go- going home with either ibuprofen tylenol or gabapentin. That's the new one is gabapentin. They want to overprescribe gabapentin. What is what is gabapentin? Gabapentin um, is a, a, it can be used um, for diabetic neuropathy. I've mm. been on it. Okay. Um, it can be used for depression. It can be used as an anticonvulsant, I think. Um, the thing is, is the adverse reactions, in my case, The memory loss and brain fog were so substantial that I was getting ready to be tested for early onset dementia at 40. Wow. It was the gabapentin. Wow. They would rather like prescribe antidepressants. I'm not depressed. I feel like I have fire on my feet. Help me. You know what I (laughs) mean? I just, it's, 
it needs to go back to individualized health care, how each person is looked as an, as an individual and can be treated as such. You cannot paint pain with a broad brush. You really can't because people aren't cookie cutters. Mm, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. I have my own, you know. Now, do you think the reason why they don't prescribe some opioids now is because of the, the addiction to them and how prevalent it is and how prevalent it was well, Especially when they were first introduced. Yes, that is exactly why. And it's because of the 2016 guidelines. They're they're acting like the 16 guidelines. It's actually been revised in 2022, February. Okay. But that was just kind of the first step of the staircase to get what we actually need, folks, is a, is a DEA oversight hearing to... Um, it needs to be said that this needs to be between the doctor and the patient, not the doctor, patient, and the DEA. That's why doctors are stopping um, with prescriptions because they're afraid to lose their license. They're not right. going to put their livelihood on the line for you. That's why they are sending you to pain clinics. That's why people are – it's it's very, it's it's dire, folks. It, it's, I cannot tell you how dire this is. People are dying every single day because doctors are refusing to properly medicate them. They would rather – commit suicide than live like this. So it kind of sounds like to me that it's not necessarily a problem of the doctors. It's the kind of the system that they're entrapped in, right? That's correct. That's and correct. So how do you how do you revamp that system? So we've got to start writing writing our legislators. Let me be very frank. Pain does not care who you vote for. <laughs> okay. So like I I don't care if you're a Republican. I don't care if you're a Democrat. I don't care if you're an independent. Write your legislators, okay? They need to hear from us. That's how we get this changed is by getting the laws changed. It's not fair that when we have a doctor that provides a validating and um, positive experience. We're calling them a unicorn doctor. And why we call them that is they're so very few and far between. They're like a mythical creature. Mm. That's not okay. I mean, pe people are petrified. They just don't know what to do. I, I mean, how are those doctors looked at from like their community? Are they looked at as kind of like wax? Because, because like you said, they're far and few between. I mean, are they are they kind of looked down upon from other doctors in their community? That's correct. Yeah. They're getting the shade. Absolutely. These doctors would rather make a dime than properly medicate you. Pain meds have been used since the Civil War. Why are we changing it now? Not, and, and, and the thing is, is, is the fear of addiction is outweighing anything else. Not everybody is an addict, folks. Addiction is a is a brain disease. Um a lot of people mistake the word dependence for addiction, and they're two very, very different words. I'm physically dependent on insulin, but nobody questions when I pick up my insulin that I'm going to take it properly. Mm. Why are people questioning whether I'm going to take my pain meds properly? I mean, does does insulin give you the same kind of effects that like an opioid, opioid would give you? It helps me live. I should say that. It brings down my blood sugar. I mean, a lot of people, not a lot of people, people can overdose on insulin as well. Yeah. Um, but as far as like feeling like a high, like getting a high from it, is that possible? People that live in this type of pain don't even get, as you say, a high. People that... I understand. Yes. But there, but there are people that do take pain medications because they're, addic they're addicted to that's them. That's correct. You're correct. Or they've crossed over the line from taking it for an injury and then they're right. now taking it because they like the feeling and it's not just controlling the pain. You're right. Correct. Right. Yes. I don't know. I, I just, it's frustrating that. I, I, I feel like it's like a real, I understand. It's a slippery slope. It's a real slippery slope because how do you, how do you help other people, the people who do need it? without affecting the people that will become addicts and will abuse it. That's correct. Um, well, that's where MAT, which is M-A-T, which is Medication Assisted Treatment, which is one of the most validating and amazing experiences I have ever heard of in my life. It MAT is not a sub for addiction. Um, People that are on mat, which can either be um, Vivitrol, which you can use for alcohol abuse, uh, Suboxone, mm. which you can use for opiate use disorder, um, or Methadone. Um, 
just because you're on that you that you take mat does not mean that you're not sober. Being sober has many different paths, and as long as you're accountable to yourself and you're staying on the, your path, I'm proud of you. Um, addiction is a doesn't really have to do with the substance, folks. It's a it's a disease. It's a yeah. brain disease. Yeah, I was and, I was just talking to my coworker about this because he's an he, he's a I call him a recovering alcoholic, and he's like, don't call me that. He's like, because I I'm not right now. He's like, I've I've overcome that. He's like, but it's a it's a disease, you know, like kind of like um, where were we talking about? What did he compare it to? He compared it to uh, yeah, I forgot where I was going with that. I can't remember what he compared it to, but you know, it's it's a disease. It's a it's a disorder within the brain. Correct. That's correct. A lot of times addiction, the, th- the three main reasons for addiction, number one is early childhood trauma, which yeah. would be physical or sexual abuse. Yeah. Thank goodness I didn't have any of that in my childhood. And I, I, I feel horrible for anyone that's had to have that type of experience. Grief or undiagnosed mental illness. Those are the top mm. three. There are other th- reasons for addiction, but yeah. those are my top yeah. three. Yeah, you just like being high. Um, <laughs> right. So they don't, and you know, I'll, I'll be really honest with you. Um, the reason why I went to TikTok, I was force tapered off of medication, long term opiate medication, no step down. Um, I honestly can tell you it's given me a better understanding and, um, I, I've changed my thinking because I used to be very, because when you know better, you mm-hmm. do better. I used to be very staunch with my thinking with people that were in active addiction and why did they do what they do? And I didn't understand Yeah, when why? I was forced tapered off of my medication. I get it now. I understand why you never want to feel like that. It literally they can tell you it, it's it, it's not going to kill you, but it doesn't feel, it, it feels like that. It can kill you, it, can it, it? it? They tell on you certain, it's not, or, right, it's, it's going to be uh, uncomfortable, they say. I have mm. never felt, I, it's the toughest thing I've ever sp- survived in my life. So anyone who is in active addiction, I see you, I hear you, I believe you, your story is valid. Um, I understand uh, why you don't want to feel sick like that. I've never, ever survived anything anywhere near that. And it, and it really didn't have to be because that doctor ended up prescribing medication to begin with. So kind of like it was like a test of 88 days if I oh. was strong enough to stay, you know what I mean? Yeah. And it just really wasn't. It, it's When doctors do that, that's called medical gaslighting. Medical gaslighting is when a medical professional trivializes or dismisses your symptoms or experience. That's why we call the doctors that listen unicorn doctors because they're so very few and far between. The doctors just don't want to hear it. Doctors have forgotten that they're on a job interview. Like if, if you're not, I want the best of the best in my team. If you're not mm. going to wow me, you're not going to get a bite at the insurance. Well, I, I think I think for doctors, it's, it's kind of difficult because they have huge caseloads. They have yeah. so many patients. They, they like lit- Like when I go to the doctor... My doctor comes in the room and she she wonders why I'm there. She does my vitals, whatever it is, and then she helps me with whatever I need her her to you know help me with, and then she's gone, like within five minutes. Right, and it's quick. Like, like that was not personable at all. Like it it wasn't like she was like, hey, how have you been doing? Like, have you had any health issues? No, not none of that. It's like not personable whatsoever. It's almost like a conveyor belt. Like it's yeah, just so it's like an assembly line. Exact, thank of, you. of patients. That's exactly what I was gonna say. Yes. Yeah. And that's how the pain clinics ran too. Is an assembly line. They have so many bays set up yeah. with with all of these uh, gurneys so everybody can get injections. Yeah. The doctors know the injections either aren't going to work and cause long-term damage or are going to work, but they're not going to work. They'll tell you, oh, you're going to get four or five or 10 months of relief. You're lucky if you're going to get a couple of days, maybe wow. weeks. I mean, these people are hanging on for like dear life. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. they just don't want it. Nobody wants to be in that type of pain. Yeah. It's exhausting. Now, when you, you're in pain all the time. I am. Um, does it limit your capabilities as far as what you're able to do? Like, like for me, um, I'm not in pain like that. So like my capabilities of being able to like go to work, work a normal job, come home. Yeah, I'm in pain because of the day and like, my, you know, whatever. But I can work out and I can have an active lifestyle. Are, does, it li- does that limit you? Are you able to live an active lifestyle? No, not at no. all. I have people 
my Spoonies, my intractable pain patients have four usable hours a day. People that are not sick like us, we call you able-bodied people. You mm. Able-bodied people have 10 hours. That would include your eight hours at work and then commute type home. People like me, four hours. So think of the people that are working with chronic illness. They only have four usable hours, but they're trying to geek out the other four for at least work. You know what I mean? Yeah. So no, it's very limited. Um, I hate to have, I mean, I've got to like, I, I hate having to cancel on people. It's no, you don't have a life. You've got to schedule everything. Um, you've got to make sure that, you know, every other treatment method is working so that you can actually do the activities that most people take for granted. Cooking dinner, taking a shower, right. having family time. Most people don't even think about those activities a second thought. But right. the people that are sick like us, it's a good day if if we can have dinner with our family. Wow. It's very isolating. It's it, and, and, and people say, oh, well, you know, you, you can't have depression, anxiety if you have chronic pain. They go hand in hand like peanut butter and jelly. Yeah, why wouldn't it? Because if you're if it limits your capabilities of being able to live a normal life, like for me, when I don't work out, I feel depressed. Like I get kind of anxious. I get like hostile a little bit. You know, I don't feel I don't feel like I'm myself. Exactly. And so I could imagine that if you're living with pain every single day, you, you're not going to be able to be yourself. And then people are like, oh, well, you did it. You did it two weeks ago. Right. But like, if you see me out and about, that is at the best I am all day. You didn't mm. see what it took me to get to that point, if that makes sense. Right. It's it's exhausting in every sense of the word. Now, how long have you how long have you lived with this kind of pain? Since I the last time that I've been able to work outside the home was consistently was like 2015. Wow. And did you have pain before that? I did, but it wasn't to this level. Um, I had the spinal cord stimulator placed in 2016, and now I'm generally down a lot of the day. It's it's wow. hard. And what is the, what does the stimulator do? So what it's supposed to do is scramble the pain signals to the brain. Um, that was just one of the new. Fungawi uh, devices that the pain clinics are pushing <laughs> on their people. They, I went with the more invasive surgery because I wanted better coverage. The trial was amazing, and that's usually what happens to most folks, so they move on to the, the permanent. Mm -hmm. Well, they didn't wake me up to make sure to check placement that it was reaching where it was supposed to, and it's never reached past the middle of my feet. It was supposed to encompass my toes as well. So I knew about three weeks post-op I was in trouble and they can't wow. move it and i've been reprogrammed 23 times and sorry about your luck but that's your baseline is what they tell me reprogrammed so basically with the spinal cord stimulator you carry around a um a remote control okay. or it's on your phone and you have when it starts out it's like six different uh programs that have different impulses or different uh, speeds or different strengths of impulses that only you can feel because the machinery is in you. Like somebody can't feel like your stomach or like your leg and feel a vibration. This, right. No, yeah. it's like a, it's like a tens unit on speed. If that's what you want to say, it's like, <laughs> that's like tens yeah. unit. You can, you can carry around in the electrodes around the outside. Yeah. The, uh, I have one of those. Yeah. So basically the spinal cord simulator is like a tens unit, but you know, the granddaddy of one. Correct. Wow. I mean, I mean, it's, it's quite lucrative. Like all together, it was like $125,000 surgery for it yeah. not to work. That's, that's devastating. I was going to, they told me I was going to be able to go back to work. Wow. I'm now bed bound. So you, you can just hit that whenever you want. That's right. Well, it's oh. off now. I've had major complications with it, but the, yes. And um, it doesn't give you any relief. No, none nope. at all. It never reached the, the, the higher I turned it up, the more I would feel it like in my upper legs and stomach and instead of the lower leg, it wouldn't motor down to my toes. Wow. Devastating. Wow. And I went with the more invasive so that I had a better success rate. You know what I mean? Yeah. I had never had back surgery in my life. Wow. I could imagine that you probably wouldn't have done it if you knew. That's correct. I, it's the worst. It, for me personally, it's the worst decision I've ever made in my life. Wow. Um, now, are there any other like uh, like treatments that you can do like that are like kind of like self treatments like as far as like because it's nerve pain, right? Yes. Oh, yes. So is, can you do like ice baths or like things like that that yes. helps stimulate? Um, well, I do a lot. I have a couple of different treatment methods. I use... I, I use cannabis every single day. It okay. is an integral part of my treatment toolbox. Um, a lot of people 
are afraid of uh, when you get a sativa strain, you can get more of a, of a head high mm. and a paranoia. Okay. If you have nerve damage, an indica strain is a full body, and that's exactly what you want because it, it helps takes relax. yes, it takes the sharpness. I'm able to go longer between my medication doses when I when I dose cannabis. Does that mm. make sense? Yeah. So it's a it's it's a great add on to my pain meds. Yeah. I also use um, foot baths. I love Dr. Teal's foot baths to try mm. to get the um, sensation going back in my feet. I use nano socks, which are compression socks. Okay. Capsaicin patches. So like capsaicin, like um, the, it's like a, a hot pepper. So if you put it on nerve um, damage, like my feet, I use the um, patches and I use, sorry, and I use the um, cream and it brings the, the burning down the sharpness down it's people like that have our pain never medicate to no pain we medicate to can function most days wow that's so wild and you've got to remember you like 73 percent of us don't use a walker wheelchair or cane so you really don't know who's sick like this and who's not sick like this now can you define um pain from the pain that you're experiencing like let's say you like you let's say you step on like hot stones or something can you still feel that a little or, bit or does it like dumb down the, the actual pain you're experiencing it physically does. it does and i i'm assuming that a lot of people when i when they see me walk they they probably think that i, I may be impaired and i'm not mm. because i can't feel <laughs> well, i can't feel my feet i, yeah. I kind of stumble and i kind of do one of these numbers I, I do walk with a cane when i'm out in public but yeah i'm sure a lot of people kind of look but yeah, it's it's it affects your balance big time. Wow. Big time. And if you can't feel the wounds on your feet, that's where amputations can come can come in because right. you're not taking care of your feet. Yeah. Now is this something that uh you do you think this has something to do with being a preemie? Uh, I, I do. Part of it, yes. I, I am diabetic, but I didn't I wasn't diagnosed until I was twenty eight. So I lived wow. most of my life and then at twenty eight it was like flip the script type of deal. Yeah. Um, I promised myself that, Is that if type I, one, type two, type actually two. I'm a 1.5. So I'm on insulin and, okay. but I am still controlling it with diet. Okay. I promised myself that if I found a doctor to help me with my pain, that the next step was my diabetes. And, and I've come through with that. I brought my A1C down quite a bit in the, in the last year. Um, so anybody who's diabetic, a CGM, which is a con- continuous glucose meter, has been a life-changing treatment method. Mm. Like, I'm not in damage control anymore. When you're diabetic, you're, you can test up to four times a day. I don't have to test on my fingers because I have a sensor that I wear. I change it every 10 days. I have real-time numbers. I'm wow. meal planning. I, I promised myself, Casey, if you can survive this, Next is diabetes. So I'm really proud of myself. Yeah, you should be. But that's that's why I came to TikTok because I knew there had to be other people just like me. Yeah. And there is. Yeah. There's so, thousands. So what's the feedback since you started? When did you start the TikTok? I started off? the TikTok um, July of 2021. Okay. Um, I'm on. Okay. So TikTok, there, there's like, there's kind of like a weird side to social media. Um, people can think they can say and do whatever they want just because they're behind the keyboard. Yeah. This is my fifth account. People, um, they can do like mass reporting, but the, the feedback has been great if it wasn't for the trolls. <laughs> I all together, because like I said, this is my fifth account. Like they can take one quickly. I have had, I think all together, I think it was like 16,000 followers. For wow. me, that's quite a bit. I know some people, like, I've, I've had, um, this account I have right now has 1,200, but, like, I have, like I said, I have the other four accounts. But I, I, the, I'm giving this my all. People are so appreciative of just having somewhere to vent, mm. to say, yeah. wait a minute, I'm not alone. There's somebody else like me. You know what I mean? Yeah. You, you've given me, like, the light, a lot of people say, if that makes sense. Yeah. You've given me the... You've given me my voice back, whether it's teaching them how to talk to a doctor, you know, how to find a doctor. A lot of people, when you go to the doctor and the doctor looks at you and says, well, you know, how do you feel? Well, it hurts. You've got to explain how it hurts. 
very descriptive terms, lacerating, ripping, tearing, piercing. Mm -hmm. You've got to make them think about what you're feeling, but they can't see it. Right. If that makes sense. Yeah, there's no test for it. No. Yeah. Nope. Um, It's... It's hard to deal with sometimes. It's heavy to carry around. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. It's frustrating when you talk to anybody about anything and you're trying to describe something to them and they're they don't understand they don't understand what you're trying to say and what what you're trying to describe. And I couldn't imagine having to try to describe to a doctor the kind of pain you're experiencing and them not being able to understand or not believe you or not believe you. Yeah. That's right. I really think, especially in today's day and age, I think that like with virtual reality or whatever they have going on, I think that there should be a place where each room shows you what an invisible illness feels like, like like neuropathy. Like you could put on the headset and, and watch what I'm feeling. Does that make sense when I say that? It does. Is my 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 question is is do does the medical field look at it as kind of like a like like a fake thing, like it's not necessarily a real a real thing, and that it might be just kind of psychological. That's why they're giving depression meds to begin with, folks. Yep, they don't absolutely correct because they, they don't, don't believe you. They don't believe you. That's correct. They may not say they don't believe you, but if they're prescribing, um, you know, oh well, let's put you on this. I'm not depressed. I'm in pain. Mm. Uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's 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 frustrating to not be believed because you're you're walking in there assuming that you're going to be believed no matter what. Yeah. So when a doctor looks at you, it causes medical trauma. It, it damages people when a doctor looks at you and says, I don't believe you, even though you know what you're feeling. Mm, Just because yeah. others can't see it doesn't negate it or make it not as bad as it is. Yeah. Um, is there I, is there doctors locally that um, that you would like re- recommend for for people like you? Yes, actually. Well, I make I I'm what I'm trying. Sorry, sorry. You're good. You can push that wherever. Just I don't know what I, I okay, oh, there we go. <laughs> um the top the the best way to find doctors locally is you need to head to and read doctor reviews. That is the biggest way to help your fellow legacy pain patient. So there's really no like a uh, forum that you can go to that has like a list of doctors there. You really got to do the homework yourself. That's correct. You have to do the homework yourself. That's correct. That's why doctor reviews are so important. Um, if you're afraid that your doctor is going to, uh, you know, get mad at you for leaving a review, then that doctor may not be the yeah. best doctor <laughs> for you. Um, that's the biggest way to help uh, you might want to move it slightly closer. Yeah, that's good right there. That's the biggest way you can help your entire community, but especially the chronic pain community, is by leaving doctor reviews. The top four search engines I use, Google, Health Grades, WebMD, and Vitals.com. It doesn't have to be a long review, folks. Just get your point across. It, it, you know, you don't want to go to a doctor and think this person's going to help you when in actuality, if they would, somebody just would have left the review and you saw mm. the review, you wouldn't have went to that doctor. You yeah. know what I mean? I, yeah. Pain patients don't have the time to waste. Does that make sense? Our, our four usable hours are right. used sparingly. Yeah. I mean, could you imagine only having four hours per, and they're not together? They're never together usually. So like I have to like recharge the batteries to be able to do anything else. I hate, I hate not being able to do multiple activities per day. Like I would love to be able to go, uh, you know, to the grocery store and out to dinner and take a shower all on the same day. It absolutely doesn't happen. Wow. It's very restrictive. It's isolating. Um, we know you don't know what to say. Well, just say I'm here. I'm listening. You know I, what I mean? I think it's so easy too to kind of just be like, well, you know, why can't you do that? And it's, it, but the thing is, is like, we don't, we don't, the people like me don't, have don't never understand. experienced that. Exactly. You don't understand. You don't understand. There is nobody harder on me than me. You know the, what I mean? The thing is like, why would anybody choose to do that? Like if it Thank was, you. if it wasn't real. That's correct. You're absolutely correct. Like I, who, You already get it. <laughs> you're, you're absolutely correct. It's like, nobody would willingly live like this, would they? I, I don't, I don't know anybody who would. And I'm going to tell you what, if there was any other option other than 
pain medication, I would be doing it. I would immediately mm. come off my pain meds. A lot of people think, oh, well, you're, you're addicted. No, no, no. Addiction's up here. I would love nothing more than to never have to take a pain medication again. If there ever becomes an option that is going to help me that's not pain meds and I can come off them, beautiful. And that's 99% of pain patients will look at you and tell you that exact statement. It's not, we loathe having to take medication like this. Yeah. It's yeah. horrible. Yeah. I mean, to it's live hard a, on your system, it is, it's hard on your system. It's hard on your, and on your life. I mean, it, it, it does not feel good to have to live life living on pills. That's, right. You're, you're correct. If there was any other option, that's a, that is what I would be doing. There's, there's only two options. I personally haven't tried one is ketamine infusions and the other one is stem cell replacement. I cannot swing those long term financially and neither are covered by my private insurance. How expensive, how expensive are those? Anywhere between three to five grand a pop. I mean, I could probably handle a couple of them. We could, you mm -hmm. know, rearrange stuff, but yeah. like I couldn't do it long term. And how long do those things, how long do those last? A lot of people that use ketamine for neuro neuropathic pain, which it also can be used for depression, they have good success with it. Like, Isn't it used for addiction too? Um, It can, it yeah. can be. Yep. It's, it's, and the other thing is stem cell replacement. It's just not covered yet. I've tried everything that's covered under the insurance. I've done it. There's nothing else I can do. I might like end last resorts for treatment at 42 folks. Can you imagine? Wow. Wow. And you've had a spine surgery. Correct. C correct. And wow. I'll tell you what, I was a CNA in a nursing home. I've been a CNA since February of 2000. Taking care of the elderly is my absolute passion behind being a good mom. That's exactly what I would be doing if I wasn't sick. So I don't have a back problem. I've never, ever, I, I've lifted 400 pound people by myself. You know what I mean? Yeah. It wasn't a back issue. Yeah. I just, it makes me, it makes me jaded. Does that make sense? Yeah. It shouldn't be like this. Yeah. It really shouldn't. Um, so what do you think needs to change? What do I think needs to change? As far as like the medical field and, and doctors being able to understand. Well, first, let me ask this. Have you, through your TikTok following and speaking out about it, have you had doctors reach out to you? Yes, I have had um, a couple of doctors reach out to me. There are um, a couple of doctors that are on the same page as me. Um, the doctors, um, they want to be able to treat their patients like they should, but they're afraid because uh, they're afraid the DEA is going to come in and shut them down. I don't understand what the DEA has to do with my quality of life. I would never, ever look at someone else and say, you can't have X, Y, Z because of somebody else's negative experience. That doesn't negate my positive one. Mm. And the doctors are afraid to prescribe medication because they're afraid that, that they're going to come in and shut them down. So it goes back to having a conversation with the DEA. That's correct. We need a DEA oversight hearing where that where it's federal, where it's it's across the land, folks. It's not, you know, just a Michigan thing. Yeah. Because then each state can have their own, you know, um, their own variation of it. Now, if it's a federal, if it's passed federally, then that's it should be at the discretion of. The doctor, as long as the doctor has a good medical standing within the state that they're working in, right? any doctor can prescribe. Yeah. It's at their discretion. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's it, it just the way that people are treated, chronic pain patients are treated when we go to the emergency room. We're treated as if we're drug seekers. We're not. It took us everything we had to go in there and ask for help. And when a condescending ER doctor or nurse walks in and uh, says, we're not going to give you anything, you can leave, you're a drug seeker, how demoralizing and humiliating They've must said that be? to you? Hell yeah. Yep, they've said it to me and millions of other people. It happens every single day. My husband knows that I don't want to go to the emergency room unless I'm unconscious. Wow. Wow. It is, it's, it's dire. And like, like I said, people that are able bodied and people that aren't sick or don't have a, like my husband, I would have no idea unless he was with me. Right. Like, like, you know, like, you know, my spouse, my kids. Yeah. It makes me sad because my daughter's 10. She doesn't know me. Yeah. Not sick. But I will say she is a fierce ally and advocate. She's a fierce advocate. So. That's cool. That's a good thing. That is a good thing. You know what I mean? What. 
I, this isn't the same thing at all, but you know, like when you have a, like a toothache, it's just agonizing. Like it, it just doesn't go away and you just want it to go away. That, that's, that's kind of what you're describing. That, you're it's, exactly it's correct. It's kind of giving me some anxiety thinking about it. Yeah. It's like, a, <laughs> it's like gnawing just it's, it's, and it doesn't stop. And yeah. then like you're, and, and then if you go to too many doctors, then you're accused of doctor shopping. Well, if the first doctor would have done what they should have done to begin with, mm. you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's frustrating. Yeah. It's frustrating. Um, Another thing is when you go to your big box pharmacy, so I'm talking Walgreens, CVS, Rite Aid, Walmart, I'm forgetting one. You've got uh, your pharmacists that are wanting to overstep their bounds. Yeah. These doctors are writing prescriptions and the pharmacists are wanting to know why you're taking them. You do not need to tell them that. As long as there's no ADR, which is adverse drug reactions, as long as you're not filling early, Fill the prescription. These pharmacists are like, I'm not filling this prescription. And then people that are getting post-op pain control are having to go re- readmitted because the pharmacist says, I'm not filling that. Mm. You've got your big box pharmacists that are being told from corporate, blatantly refuse all opiate prescriptions. It's not okay. What? I've got pharmacists in, on my TikTok lives and in my feeds that absolutely say that. Wow. Isn't that Why is that? Because of the, quote, opiate epidemic, end quote. We're way past that, folks. What you're watching right now in real time is an illicit fentanyl and heroin crisis. It has nothing to do with pain meds. That's why it's so important. If you see a publication with the word fentanyl in front and there's no word illicit in front of it, you need to contact that publication because word usage is important. When you say illicit fentanyl, people will immediately equate it with the street level drugs is what we're dealing with. When people just say fentanyl, people immediately think of the pain medication and then they start blaming pain patients. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So like word usage is really, really important. And you can't just assume that people will just know that you're talking about the fentanyl from the street because they don't. Right. They don't. Um, I've also changed my thinking. I am now um, carrying Narcan. Um, And eight months ago, I'll tell you what, you would have never... Ever, ever, I would have never carried Narcan. How do you get that? Um, you can get it at the pharmacy. Oh, I didn't know that. Yep. Um, uh, another um, myth I want to dispel, you cannot um, overdose by helping someone who's overdosing. You cannot overdose by touching someone's arm. You cannot overdose by giving them rescue breathing. We've been through this type of fear mongering before in the 80s with HIV and remember when we were kids, they used to say, well, you could, you know, everybody thought, well, you could get it because of X, Y, Z, yeah. blah, blah, blah. Yeah. You, people are dying because people are not helping when they're overdosing. I would have never thought this is where I would be in this journey, but I'm willingly carrying Narcan and I encourage everyone else to do so. Um, we've got to save people. Have you ever witnessed somebody um, overdosing? Not face to face yet. No. no. Um I have uh, been told what to do. So, um, like I said, when you know better, you do better. How do you deploy Narcan? Is so, it a shot? Yeah, nope. It's a nasal spray. Okay. And um, if you see someone overdosing, you're going to want to, you know, try to um, sternum rub them, rouse them. You know, hey, buddy, hey, hey. If you know their name, mm-hmm. um, you can try to ask if does anybody see anything. You know, if because it could also be um, like a blood sugar issue. But if you see them like you know, actively engaging in taking it, then yes, um, you can absolutely um, tilt their head back and you, uh, that's not close enough, is it? Oh, sorry. No, you're good. Um, You tilt their head back and you um, put the Narcan in their nose. It's a nasal spray. Wow. And uh, you can absolutely start CPR if you need to, if they have stopped breathing and call 911. Like I said, I would have never, ever thought that me would carry Narcan Why not? or just because like I said, I, I was very staunch, very restrictive on my beliefs on people um, in active addiction. And like I said, the experience of me having to come off my meds and being sick like that mm-hmm. has completely changed my thinking. And I'm, I'm sorry that it took me so long to get here. Yeah. I think addiction to pills is a real thing though, because, um, 
I, I work at GM and I've personally seen people addicted to pills and that's how they get through their day. That's mm-hmm. how they work overtime. And I've seen them hand them out to other people. And so it's a, it's a real thing. And, uh, I think it's a real problem too. It is. It is. The thing is, is when the doctors force taper their people, they're stopping what's called a safe supply. So like what you're getting at the pharmacy is what's known as a safe supply because you know where it's coming from. Yeah. You know what I mean? You yeah. know what's in it. Yeah. What people do is when they cross the line and they go and look. You don't know what you're getting. Correct. Yeah. You don't know what you're getting. You The calculations, the milligrams more than likely are not going to be, you know yeah. what I mean? And they're who not, knows what they're cutting it with. I was just going to yeah. say that. Exactly. Yeah. yeah Precisely. That, and and that brings us back to the whole fentanyl fentanyl problem. Yep. It's a crisis here in the United States. It really is. Yeah. So that's we, why I am carrying the Narcan because I've got to be part of the solution. Yeah. Well, I think the solution would be kind of legalizing things, wouldn't it? That's called harm reduction. You're correct. That's yeah. what harm reduction. Yes. I like. I like harm reduction. Hang on, just a second. You're Let's good. See, just a she has notes. I do. <laughs> she messaged me the other night. She's like, I'm, I'm writing notes. And I'm like, wow, she's, she's real organized. This is awesome. I love that. Okay. So um, people utilizing plants, which is P-A-T, medical Mary, Mary Jane, um, Kratom are also valid in recovery. Kratom. Yep, That's Kratom. A, it's illegal, isn't it? Kratom is not illegal. It's not. Nope. Can, you, can you buy it in the store? You can. You can buy Kratom at most smoke shops. Mm-hmm. Okay. And- yep. That's natural. It comes from like a plant, right? That's correct. From in, um, over in like Southeast Asia, Indonesia. Y- yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You can buy it at most smoke shops. If you're going to do Kratom, I would make sure it's a reputable uh, distributor. Okay. Um, a lot of people have really, really good success with Kratom. It helps with addiction, doesn't it? Well, it helps with um, people that have been forced off their medication. It kind of gives the same experience or sensation Mm. as an opiate pain med. So people that have been taken off their pain meds sometimes move to Kratom. And it's not regulated at all? It's in most smoke shops. Um, It's legal. Mm. As far as I know, um, you can't force people to, like, get clean until they're ready. Yeah. You know what I mean? You can't, like, you can bend over backwards to Tuesday. Um, (laughs) Yeah, harm reduction Vaccine services, um, getting clean, um, s- safe needles. You know what I mean? Yeah. If people are going to do it, they're going to do it. And yeah. I would rather have them have clean, safe um, things than reusing a needle and possibly transferring yeah. whatever. Yeah. It's all about, nobody wants to be in active addiction, folks. Nobody wants to be like that. I mean, I, I they just don't. They're just not ready to overcome whatever they need to overcome to become in recovery. I would say that's probably true for a lot of people. For some people though, I think they, they love being, they love being high. I'm I'm friends with a guy that I went to school with on, on Facebook and he literally just like last week or week, the week before that posted a video of him injecting himself Crazy, and like, thought it was awesome i'm like why would you be proud of that i don't understand that because like i'm diabetic and i hate giving myself insulin (laughs) i don't understand it i get it i don't understand it but i I also think addiction is a real problem i mean obviously in the brain so you know if you're i guess if you're addicted then you're having fun and you're kind of happy and so whatever i don't know uh one more thing um national pain council is a organization that I am uh, involved in. Um, you can find us on TikTok, Facebook, Instagram. Um, National Pain Council um, helps um, advocate, and it, it's helping uh, putting out um, truthful information. Um, there's lots of different pain groups. So, like, National Pain Council, what we're trying to do is kind of, like, have one um, united message. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because there's yeah. so many people that are, so like if it's, that's why it's, we have to be a united front between the chronic pain community and the recovery community because when they have us fighting each other, yeah. we're not fighting 
the main goal, which is for everyone to have compassionate, ethical healthcare, yeah. no matter what situation you're in. Is there a way to be, um, to take, to take opioids and not become an addict? Like, I mean, obviously it's a, it's a brain disease. It's yes. a disease that, you know, you're, you know, it's genetic, whatever, but is there a way that you can not be an addict from, from managing your pain? Well, that goes back because to the difference between dependency and addiction. Like I'm dependent on the meds, but like if I didn't have the pain, I wouldn't be taking the meds. Does that make sense? Yeah. So like I, people haven't, people can step over the line to addiction, but like I, there's that fine line. Yeah. Cause like, I, I would think that like, if I was somebody who was an addict, like I just had addiction tendencies and then, um, I had, you know, chronic pain and I was prescribed these medications, I think I would be concerned that I might might get get addicted. And at that point, I would, like, if that was to happen to me, I would have a discussion with my doctor. Look, this is what's going on. As long as it's in a controlled setting. So, yeah. like, you only have, say, three days or, do you know what I mean? Like, like not an entire 30-day script. There's always different ways to work around that. So somebody with past addiction issues or active addiction issues can be treated properly. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Now, is there kind of like um, a stigma or like uh, something wrapped around like people, like individuals who are addicts or were addicts and but they have chronic pain, is it d very difficult for them to get the, the help that they need? Extremely, extremely yeah. difficult. Just because somebody's had past addiction issues, they've fixed whatever was going on up here, doesn't mean that they can't be properly medicated. Yes, people with past addiction issues are struggling hard because they're not, in most cases, being believed, I guess you can say. Like, their past is following them, and everybody has a past. Yeah. But like I said, as long as it's in a controlled setting and that person is honest with whatever doctor they're going to, I personally see an addiction specialist, okay? I would have never thought that that type of doctor would have ever been in my life because mm. I'm not an addict. Yeah. But an addiction specialist understands dependence, addiction and understands the difference um just such a validating experience i would have never he you know and i looked at him at our first visit and i said do you do you think i'm an addict and he's like no he's like you don't present as one he's like if you weren't sick like this if you weren't in this pain you wouldn't be on the meds and that's the difference like yeah um, it's it's a validating experience to be able to be believed Right. You know what right. I mean? Yeah. Because everybody goes in assuming that they're going to be believed, if that makes sense. Like yeah, that's just kind of rejected. That's correct. And then you yeah. like, you start second, second guessing yourself, second thinking. Am I, is this, wait a minute. Am I really feeling what I'm feeling? Am I crazy? Thank you. <laughs> exactly. And yes. That's a, yes, absolutely. Wow. Uh, what else do you have written down? I think that's about it. I think I've covered everything. Thank you for letting me be the voice for people that haven't found their voice yet. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I couldn't imagine what it would be like to have to deal with something like that. It's, um, it's heavy. I encourage people that are not in therapy or counseling that have chronic illness or invisible illness, please seek out therapy. You've got to be able to get rid of, of that heaviness that you're carrying around. And like, there's never a a bad reason to go to therapy. Therapy is Never. just, it's just, it's amazing. I, I love getting, um, you know, all of my emotional labor off of me. I love different ways to cope. I love, it's just, it's such an amazing experience. So if you're able to therapy is. It, it's just nice to be able to sit down and talk to somebody too to help kind of have them put things into perspective. perspective. Thank you. Yeah. They don't have a dog in your race. They, they're not right. your family or friends. They, they, they look are looking from the outside in and giving you their suggestions. It's wonderful. I, I'm so glad I go to therapy. Yeah, it's important. It is. It's it very really important. is. I've gone to therapy before and um, it was for a short time, but it, it honestly helped me like overcome a lot of things. Very and, validating. It's it's yeah. nice. Uh, yes. If you're able to do th therapy counseling, I highly suggest you do. It's such a validating experience to be told, I hear you. Yeah. Now, this whole uh, episode is kind of um, 
geared towards the people with chronic pain and whatnot. But yes. I like to end the podcast generally with like uh, like some sort of word it's of like inspiration or I got one. You ready? Yes, I'm ready. Please, please uh, share. No one is immune to sickness, injury, or age. Correct use doesn't equal abuse. I love it. Thank you. Yeah. Well, Casey, thank you for doing this. Thank you, It's David. been an honor. Um, is there anything else you want to share before we wrap this up? Just to all of my legacy pain patients, I see you, I hear you, I believe you. Um, find me on TikTok at the Real Mrs. Had four which would be the number four awesome and i'll put that in the show notes Perfect. so and then as well as the uh, facebook group and the um what is it called again national pain council okay perfect yep, yes. and i'll put all that in the show notes as well thank you yep thank you